Hi everybody, this is Mark Bergeson. Thank you for joining us today for the Educators for the 21st Century 2015-16 to Professional Development Grant Program Pre-Proposal Webinar. This grant program competitively awards grants to eligible partnerships for professional development projects. This year the competition is focused on projects that will help educators implement the Smarter Balanced Interim Assessments. We'll start with a few housekeeping items and then move quickly into the main body of the presentation. So here are the housekeeping items. You should see on your screen uh, a slide that says housekeeping at the top. And uh, there are a couple of bullets on there to remind you of different things. It's helpful if you have a copy of the RFP in front of you. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and a chat log will be kept of your questions. I'll respond to your questions orally today and then we will also post a written Q&A document on the Educators for the 21st Century webpage based on today's questions and answers. And if there's a conflict between the written responses and the oral response I give, the written response prevails. Uh, we'll add to this Q&A document as time goes on and questions and answers of general interest come up. Um, please email me if you're interested in receiving notification of, upda of updates. Uh, we will also post a recording of the webinar on the same Educators for the 21st Century webpage. Now, just a few navigation items with uh, GoToMeeting, which is the software that we're using. Uh, you should see a PowerPoint presentation in the center of your screen and a control panel on your right. On the left edge of the control panel, you'll see a little toolbar with four icons showing. The top icon is a reddish-orange arrow called the Grab tab. Clicking on the Grab tab expands or contracts the control panel. Uh, I've noticed that GoToMeeting has a tendency to automatically collapse the control panel during periods of inactivity, which has the disadvantage of hiding the chat box that you type your questions in. To expand the control panel back, just click on that orange, reddish-orange arrow. Once the presentation starts, all voice transmission but mine will be muted. If you have questions, type them into the chat box in the lower part of your control panel. I will pause periodically to answer them. You'll only be able to see the chat box if the control panel is expanded. Don't forget to hit send after you've typed your questions. And please send to all so that others may see your question. During the presentation, there will be some silent pauses while I read chat box questions. So if you hear silence, don't despair regarding your audio connection. I will try to remember to announce these pauses in advance. So we'll start out with the goals for the webinar. The webinar is designed to help you understand the program and the award process. In doing so, I will highlight key features outlined in the request for proposals and also I'll try to point out potential pitfalls as we go. Um, sitting in, if I were sitting in your shoes, uh, I, I would probably find that to be among the most useful information that you could get today. Um, what I'll do as we go along is I'll try and give you the, the why, who, what, how, when, and where of the RFP. Um, and we'll start out with the why. To help you understand the why, we'll take a look at um, some of the context um, that this RFP is taking place in. The point of the context discussion is to help you understand why the RFP is the way it is. It's primary shape primarily shaped by two underlying forces. The first force is the federal priorities underlying the law that funds the program. And the second force is state priorities that influence how we operate within that federal law. Uh, incidentally, this juxtaposition of federal and state priorities informs the way that many RFPs for federal grants are developed. Uh, so there are really two contexts, a federal context and a state context. The slide you're looking at depicts the federal context. The program's authorized under Title II, Part A, Subpart 3 of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. It was created when the act was reauthorized as the No Child Left Behind Act, and it's been around since 2002. Uh, currently, 
Title II gives Wash Title II Part A gives Washington State about thirty-seven and a half million dollars a year for improving educator quality, and of that thirty-seven and a half million, the Student Achievement Council gets nine hundred thousand a year uh, to award in subpart three grants, which is what we're talking about today. The program pays for professional development that helps improve educators' ability to use state standards and assessments, uh, helps improve educators' subject matter knowledge, and helps improve principals' instructional leadership skills. Uh, these are the federally allowable uses of the, of the funds, and they're explicitly spelled out in the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, specific, specifically Section 2134. Uh, the program is a partnership grant program, and one of the reasons for that is that Congress intended for the higher education partners to learn from the experience in a way that would help them strengthen their teacher and principal preparation programs and their relationships with other departments on campus. And that, uh, that underlying congressional intent is implicit in the structure of the partnerships that the program funds. We'll get in more detail about partnership structure um, later in this presentation. Basically, Congress wanted K-12 and higher ed to learn from each other and for higher ed to work more collaboratively across departmental lines. Okay, so that's, uh, that's federal priorities. Now we'll move to state priorities. Uh, each time we issue an RFP under this program, we consult with colleagues at the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction to determine state priorities. Uh, our OSPI colleagues have provided really valuable input over the years, and we've enjoyed our collaboration with them very much. Uh, the current state priorities, as you're probably fully aware, are um, implementing the Common Core State Standards and the Smarter Balanced Assessment System. Now, this dovetails nicely with the Student Achievement Council's mission, which is to advance educational opportunities and attainment in Washington. Uh, advancing educational attainment means increasing the number of post-secondary degrees and other credentials that people have, and for this to happen, people need to be academically prepared for post-secondary education. And one strategy for accomplishing this is to promote the state's implementation of college and careers-ready standards. The Smarter Balanced Assessment System is a key component of implementing college and career ready standards in Washington. Uh, it includes summative assessments, interim assessments, and a digital library of resources for teachers. This RFP is focused on use of the Smarter Balanced Interim Assessments for instructional purposes to provide information on students' skill gaps to educators so that they can adapt instruction and curriculum to provide uh, to respond to student needs identified the assessment or else provide other su supports to respond to student needs identified by the assessment. There are two types of Smarter Balanced Interim Assessments. Uh, there are comprehensive assessments, which mimic the summative assessment, and there are interim assessment blocks, which focus on smaller sets of targets and provide more detailed information for instructional purposes. The comprehensive assessment is available now, and the interim assessment blocks will be available on July 27th. So you may be wondering why are we focusing on the interim assessments. The main reason is that we see them as a tool for helping close opportunity gaps faced by some students. Uh, these include students of color, ELL students, students with disabilities, and students from low-income families. Closing opportunity gaps is important to us because we want to increase educational attainment for all students. And to us, all really does mean all. And hopefully that's apparent uh, as you read the RFP. We want this grant to help educators use the interim assessments um, to inform uh, instructional decisions that will help close opportunity gaps. And the beauty of the interim assessments is that this can, they can be used at both the classroom and the school levels to accomplish this. Now hopefully the presentation so far has helped you understand the underlying state and federal priorities that shape the RFP. Now we'll move on to a description of the program.
To understand the mechanics of the RFP, uh, we'll focus on the elements of this description that I've underlined here. As we go over these elements, I'll speak in terms of who, what, where, and when. Uh, we've already discussed why when we covered the context. So let's start with who. And this is uh, one of the most interesting aspects of this program. Uh, to be eligible for funding, the partnership has to include at a minimum uh, three required partners. And once you have those three required partners, you can include any number of optional partners. And the partnership, uh, including the required partners, is one of the main pitfalls that projects run into. Uh, it's also one of the main reasons that we ask you to file a notice of intent, which, by the way, is due next Friday. Uh, the notice of intent will allow us to identify and troubleshoot partnership issues early in the process. The next shi slide shows the required partners in detail. The first partner is really kind of a two-part partner because the institution of higher education and its division that prepares teachers and or principals count as a single partner uh, for purposes of this program. The division that prepares teachers and or principals would be a college of education or an education program or some similar academic unit. Uh, whatever it's called, it has to be regionally accredited and it also has to be approved by the Professional Educator Standards Board to prepare licensed teachers or principals in Washington. The second partner is a college or university school of arts and sciences that offers an appropriate major. Uh, if you look at the second bullet on the slide in front of you, um, please note the words offers one or more academic majors uh, in disciplines or content areas corresponding to the academic subjects in which the teachers served by the project teach. Uh, these are core academic subjects um, and the teacher doesn't have to specifically teach a class with the name of the subject in the class's title, uh, it's just that the subject matter has to be part of the class. Um, and so what would be an example of uh, uh, partner, a higher education partner that would could serve uh, as the required second partner here. Um, for example, a math department would work here if a project was focused on implementing the smarter balanced interim assessments in math. An English department would work if a project was focused on implementing the smarter balanced interim assessments in English language arts and literatures. Other departments might work too, but check with me first, please, um, uh, so that we can discuss whether the partner would work and so that I can ask the U.S. Department of Education what they think uh, if I need to ask them a question about it. Uh, a project that focuses on both math and lingu English language arts and literacy uh, would need two schools of arts and sciences partners, one for math and one for English language arts and literacy. I apologize, I think I said English language arts and literature earlier. I meant literacy. Sorry about that. The third required partner is a high need school district. Now we're on the third bullet of the slide. You can find a definition of high need in the definitions section of the RFP on page 9, and you can find a list of high need school districts in Exhibit F on page 37 of the RFP. The list of high need school districts uh, in Exhibit F was developed by applying the definition to Federal 2012 Census data and OSPI 2013-14 Washington State Report Card data. Those were the most recent data that we had uh, at the time the RFP was issued. Uh, one other thing to note is that projects providing service within multiple target regions have to serve at least one high-need school district from each target region. And the target regions are laid out in, um, uh, as ESD regions in the uh, 
uh, exhibit F there. And I apologize, you probably hear my phone ringing. That's something I forgot to do uh, before I started the, the webinar. So let me just uh, let me just fix that little mistake here. Okay, hopefully hopefully it won't ring again. Um, and uh, uh, oh dear, now I've done something I should. I, I apologize for this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's probably the worst thing I could have done. Okay, well, hopefully this is making you laugh a little bit. And uh, and I'll see. Okay, okay. Well, hopefully it'll be more quiet now. Uh, we will see. Sorry about that. Um, I wanted to offer an explanation for why these partners are required partners. Uh, first, it's to encourage two-way learning so higher ed programs can be informed by what the higher ed faculty learned during their service in the project. Second, Congress wanted to encourage communication across departments and universities. So that's why we have one of the reasons for having the arts and sciences partner, that second partner in there. Um, another reason, of course, is to provide subject matter expertise. Um, when this legislation was written, Congress perceived that the level of interaction between colleges of education and other academic units at uh, colleges and universities wasn't high. Uh, colleges of ed were sort of perceived as the poor stepchild at universities, and so one of the underlying reasons of the partnership having these partners that it does is to get uh, get some cross communication going on campuses. Now as long as the partnership has all of the required partners it can include as many optional partners from the list on page 6 of the RFP as it wants to. This list is long. Uh, it includes higher education partners um, yeah, such as community and technical colleges for example. It can include other uh, four-year college university partners and then it goes on beyond higher ed, and it can include um, K-12 optional partners, educational service districts, for example. Uh, that's a good one. There's been a fair amount of interest in this RFP from educational service districts, and uh, uh, it can also include nonprofit organizations, businesses, and uh, principal or teacher organizations, such as WEA or AWSP. There's one uh, optional partner here that has kind of a special status, and that is nonprofit private schools. Their status is special in that they need to be offered equitable participation. Uh, so, in other words, you have to you have to invite them to the table, uh, and they are free to accept or decline. So, they're not a required partner, uh, but it is required that you invite them. Um, what this boils down to is that you need to contact nonprofit private schools located in the districts your project will serve and offer them meaningful and timely opportunities for participation in the design and implementation of the project, uh, equivalent to the oper opportunities that you're giving public schools uh, to design and participate. Okay, now let's talk about roles within the partnership. Uh, the default model in a partnership with just the required partners so the simplest partnership you could have uh, is that the higher education partners provide professional development to the K-12 partners. Uh, the idea is that the teacher or principal prep unit would provide expertise related to instruction, and the School of Arts and Sciences partner, that'd be the math department or the English department, would provide subject matter expertise. Uh, now there are plenty of variations on this. Um, for example, personnel from optional partners can provide professional development, uh, and K-12 partners can have expert teachers or coaches provide professional development. Uh, so that, that kind of thing is fine, but you do have to let the higher ed partners have a significant role. Uh, the project director, or at least one co-director, has to be a tenured or tenure-track faculty member of one of the required higher ed partners. 
and this faculty member has to provide effort comparable to or greater than the effort of other key personnel in the project. Uh, in fact, all of the required partners have to play key roles in planning and implementing the project. One key role that a partner will play is that of fiscal agent. Now, the universe of fiscal agents is limited. Only institutes, institutions of higher education, high-need school districts, or ESDs may be fiscal agents. So let's talk a little bit about what a fiscal agent partner does. Uh, this slide outlines the duties of the fiscal agent partner. Fiscal agent partner is the one that the Student Achievement Council will be interacting with. Uh, on all levels. Um, in short, it serves as the lead partner in a partnership. Okay, now let's shift from the structure of the partnership to the target audience that the professional development is aimed at helping. The target audience is in-service K-12 educators. Uh, all projects have to serve teachers and principals or assistant principals, uh, but serving highly qualified paraprofessionals is optional. If a project does serve highly qualified parapros, uh, it serves them in the same way as it serves teachers. The teachers have to be certificated in-service teachers of core academic subjects. Uh, I mentioned that term earlier. Core academic subjects is defined on page 8 of the RFP as English, uh, reading or language arts, mathematics, science, foreign language, civics and government, economics, arts, history, and geography. So it's a pretty long list. Uh, you just have to make sure that uh, uh, the teachers you're serving teach subject matter from that list. Uh, principals and assistant principals that are served by the project have to be responsible for instructional leadership in mathematics or English language arts and literacy in their schools. The professional development they receive has to be specifically designed to improve their ability to lead teachers of mathematics or English language arts and literacy. Uh, general instruction to train principals for entry-level positions or advancement opportunities isn't eligible for funding. Uh, it's it's got to be discipline-specific professional development. Assistant principal is an interesting term. It's not defined in the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Um, so you can use your district definitions. Uh, but do document that whoever you are serving as an assistant principal meets the district's definition of that term, uh, because that may be checked up on uh, if we have a uh, uh, federal visit or an auditor visit later. The term highly qualified professional, highly qualified paraprofessional is defined on page 9 of the request for proposals. Highly qualified Parapro is one who has uh, not less than two years of experience in a classroom coupled with post-secondary education or demonstrated competence in a field or academic subject for which there's a significant shortage of qualified teachers. If you do decide to serve highly qualified parapros, uh, you'll need to obtain a certification that they are indeed highly qualified. That's something U.S. Department of Ed uh, has checked on in the past. So now let's move from who the projects serve to what the projects are supposed to do. And at the end of this slide, we'll have a pause for questions. Uh, I'll give you a couple moments to read the slide. Uh, meanwhile, I'm going to check the chat log to see if uh, questions have come in so far. Okay, you can see from the slide that um, there are three uh, what we call required project goals. And the reason that they're required is that these are th what the federal money can be used for. Uh, so in order to be eligible for the funding, you have to address these goals. And they're important. Um, 
and uh, actually they're the source of about 60% of the points that are available in the proposal scoring rubric. Um, so that's an indicator of their importance. So there are three of them. Uh, the first is to um, uh, ensure teachers and principals are able to use interim assessments to improve instruction and student achievement. The second is to ensure teachers have subject matter knowledge in the core academic subjects they teach. And then the third is to ensure that principals have instructional leadership skills. I'm just paraphrasing here. Uh, what these required goals really are is a, a distillation of the state priorities that I mentioned earlier, uh, boiled down so they fit into the federal legal framework uh, and are, are consistent with the federal priorities that I mentioned earlier. So everything that a project does needs to be designed to accomplish these goals. And you do have some flexibility. Projects that focus on addressing these goals with respect to the interim assessments may also address them with respect to the summative assessments and may also provide professional development on the use of the Smarter Balanced Digital Library in support of attainment of the goals. Uh, please don't try to include other goals in your proposal. Uh, these goals are it. They define the allowable uses of funds, so if you have other goals that aren't in this set here, uh, we can't fund them. Uh, goals that apply to teachers also apply to highly qualified parapros who assist those teachers, and um, as I said before, you, you may serve parapros if you wish, uh, but you must serve teachers and principals or assistant principals. Okay, so at this point I'm going to pause for questions. And I see from the chat box that there was a question earlier about um, the link to the request for proposals. Uh, uh, thank you for answering that, Nicole. Um, and I have not seen any other questions since then. Uh, so I'll pause and give you a few moments to type here. And do remember to hit send after you finish typing. Uh, hit send or return, otherwise uh, I won't be able to see your question. And I'll respond to questions orally now, and then uh, later uh, I'll respond again in writing as part of a published question and answer document. Okay, so there will be some dead air time here while we wait for questions. Okay, excellent. We're having some questions come in. And uh, this is a really good question. How is this applicable for elementary teachers who teach multiple subjects? Are interim assessments for available for grades K through 2? And I believe the answer to that one is uh, no. I think the interim assessments start at grades 3. Uh, so, for elementary teachers for grades three and up, um, this would be applicable. Uh, uh, applicable in the sense that the teacher doesn't have to teach a, a class in math. Let's say a project was focused on interim assessments in math. Um, teacher doesn't have to teach a class that is solely mathematics, uh, but as long as the class that's being taught contains mathematics in it uh, as, as one of the content areas of the class, for example, a, a third grade elementary teacher has math as a component of that class, um, then this would be applicable. Um, th that teacher would be able to use the interim assessments. Uh, for K-2 teachers, um, I suppose it's possible they could use them for advanced students. I'm honestly not sure how a K2 teacher would use the interim assessment. Um, yeah, sorry, don't have a better answer on that one. Let's see, here's another question. Can an ESD be a fiscal partner in this grant 
and also a math science partnership grant? Um, and the answer to that one is yes. And here's another question. Right now, the interim score reports do not give an item analysis. Do we anticipate that they will next school year? Uh, I'm not sure about anticipate. I hope they will. Um, and we'll know more about that as time goes on. Um, OSPI has been giving some webinars about the interim assessments, and those webinars are a good place to get updates for questions like that. And I am working from memory here, but I don't remember hearing from those webinars a firm commitment that item analysis would be available next school year. So let's just leave that as a hope for right now. That's a question I can follow up in with follow up on via an email to OSPI. Okay, three questions so far. Any others? How often would the interim assessments be required to be given? The interim assessments are optional, so uh, a school that's using them can give them as frequently or as infrequently as it would like to. Uh, that's, that's completely up to, up to the school or school district. I think it's probably at the district level that the choice of whether to use the interim assessments or not is made, and uh, perhaps that would be the level that frequency of use would be determined on as well, although it's conceivable districts could give instructors a, a lot of latitude in how frequently. So that question uh, is, is one where the answer is it depends, depends on the district and school choice. Are there other questions out there? I'll probably wait for about uh, 15 more seconds here before moving on. Oh, here's one. Can you make a distinction between the interim block and comprehensive? Sure. Uh, the interim block assessments are designed uh, to mirror or mimic the summative assessments, and, and so they cover many different topic areas in the same test, whereas the block assessments are used to assess um, student learning in particular topic areas. Um, so the block assessments enable you to enable you to take a more detailed and focused look at a particular subtopic within uh, for example math so the block assessment could be on a uh, uh, part of geometry or on functions within algebra or something like that they're narrower are there other questions Okay, well, I think we'll move on, and if you do have other questions, um, there will be other opportunities to ask them as the presentation progresses, and we'll open the floor for all sorts of general questions at the end of the presentation. All right, well, now let's move from... Uh, let's move from the what to the how. Let's see... Um, how projects might approach accomplishing these goals. The slide I'm showing now gives you some examples of uh, professional development activities that could be funded under this grant program. And it's certainly not an exhaustive list. Um, in the past, our projects have typically offered summer institutes of some sort followed up on during the academic year by one or more of the other activities on this list. Uh, regardless of what type of activities you choose, you have to offer at least 48 contact hours per person uh, of professional development to teachers and at least 12 contact hours per person to principals, and that's over the life of the project. Uh, contact hours uh, can be either in person or online, and you may find that a mix of those two uh, modes of delivery works well for you. Uh, that kind of mix can work especially well for um, 
schools out in rural areas. I've seen projects in the past that maybe have uh, one or two uh, large group face-to-face -face convenings uh, supplemented by online interaction, um, and, and that seems to work fairly well for folks. Uh, so now we'll move from the how to the when. Uh, there's a term of art uh, in these grants called period of performance, and the period of performance for these projects is um, uh, mid-April 2015 through August 31st of 2016. So it's about 14 and a half months. Um, your professional development activities have to be complete by the end of June 2016, and then we give you July and August of 2016 for um, for final reporting. So again, the activities have to be done by the June 30th, 2016, and the reporting has to be complete by August 2016. And now we'll move from when to where. Uh, we're, there's a federal rule that requires equitable geographic distribution of grant funds, and um, we have $900,000 available in total statewide, and uh, that works out to 100,000 per ESD region served. Um, we'll refer to those regions as target regions. So there are nine ESDs, nine target regions. Projects can request up to $100,000 per target region served and may serve multiple regions. Uh, the more regions you serve, the more funding you can request up to uh, the whole pot, 900000 for a statewide project that serves all nine regions. So there are some economies of scale here. Uh, the school district partners within each region served must include at least one high-need school district in that region. Uh, if you propose a multi-region project, uh, you may be asked to scale it down uh, because there's a chance that the review process could result in uh, funding a different project for one of the more one or more of the regions that you've proposed to serve. So, for example, if you're uh, doing a project that serves um, five regions, and the review panel decides that one of those regions is better served by a different project, uh, we may end up asking you to serve only four of the five regions that you intended to serve, and then the other region would be served by a different project. That's just one example. Um, one thing that we're trying that's new this year is that if we don't get enough proposals to serve all of the regions, we may increase the funding per region. Um, so I'll pause again for questions here. And it looks like um, no new ones have come in yet uh, since the last one that we had about making a distinction between the interim block and comprehensive assessments. So I'll wait a few seconds. Uh, to see if anybody else has questions here about this ge geographic distribution of projects. Okay, here's a question. Am I to understand that a school district not identified in Appendix F may participate as a school district as long as a school district that does appear in Appendix F is participating? And the answer is, that's right, you've got it. Uh, your understanding is 100% is correct. Here's a new question. What percentage of the allocation must go to higher ed partners or LEA partners? And uh, as with so many of these questions, uh, uh, the answer is, it depends. It depends on on what you're doing and who you're serving. There is no set minimum or maximum percentage. Um, but I will point out a potential pitfall here. Um, we've had projects in the past uh, that were led by one of the optional partners that didn't give very significant roles to the required higher ed partners. And that kind of came back uh, to haunt them because the required ed part, higher ed partners that didn't have significant roles dropped out mid-project. And that means that the partnership is no longer eligible for funding. 
Um, so you have to be careful when you're putting together partnerships that you give significant roles to all of the required partners, but there is no minimum percentage. Okay, here's a new question. Can you give the allocation ratio a guess or an estimate? Huh. Hadn't thought about that yet. Um, the, the further you get from extreme lows, the better. And personally, and, and this judgment would depend on, on who's making the judgment, based on my experience, I would, I would urge against uh, having less than 10% of the funding uh, go to uh, the, each of the required higher ed partners. Uh, for the required high need school district, that's a different story because some of those high need districts are very small and it may not take 10% of the uh, partnership funding uh, to to serve a small, uh, small high need school district adequately. So th th those are just rough um, and that's just sort of based on a guest feeling. But my best advice would be to instead of aim for percentages of funding, just think in terms of providing significant roles. I think if you do that then the funding will just sort of work itself out. Are there other questions? Okay, here's a new one. For clarification, the school would give the interim assessments, the higher ed would provide professional development to teachers? Yes, so um, I, the answer is yes. The, that's one way of doing it. The higher ed, uh, that's kind of the default model. The higher ed would provide professional development to the teachers in how to use the interim assessments and uh, the school would provide the interim assessments. Yeah, so the professional development is how to use the interim assessments um, and, and those would be provided by the school. Yeah. Are there other questions? Okay, um, seeing none, I'll proceed. Uh, so far I've been trying to help you understand the mechanics of the grant program uh, by telling you about the, the who, what, where, when, how, and why of it. And now we're going to shift our focus away from the program and move our focus to the competitive process, uh, which is probably something that you're all very interested in. We'll start with a timeline. The slide you're seeing now shows a list of important dates. Um, there's a mandatory notice of intent to apply that's due by 5 o'clock p.m. next Friday, January 16th. There isn't any form for it. Just make sure you answer all the questions listed in Appendix, uh, I'm sorry, Exhibit E on page 35 of the RFP. You may want to take a, a moment to turn to that page now. It's page 35 of the RFP. It's Exhibit E. And towards the bottom of the page, you'll see a, a series of, of items to address, questions to answer. Now, this notice of intent is mandatory, um, but it's easy to complete, and it's not binding. Its purpose is to help us identify potential partnership issues and to help us know how much reviewing work we will have. Uh, so that we can start recruiting and assigning reviewers and give them an idea of how much work they're signing up for. Uh, if you submit a notice of intent and something changes, maybe you switch partners or something like that after you've submitted it, uh, no problem. This is, it's required, but it's really just informational to help us troubleshoot early on in the process. Um, 
if something does change, it's to your advantage to let us know about the change so that we can do the same kind of uh, troubleshooting and vetting uh, for the post-change version as we did for the pre-change version. One thing to notice about the timeline is that you have complaint and protest procedures available to you. Uh, the difference between a complaint and a protest is that a complaint deals with flaws you perceive related to the RFP, and a protest deals with flaws you perceive uh, related to the outcome. Uh, the RFP outlines uh, what are allowable grounds for complaint and protest. I won't go into detail on that now, um, but there are sections in the RFP that, that do that. Um, I, and then finally, I want to bring to your attention that proposals are due by 5 o'clock p.m. Uh, on March 3rd of 2015. I see there's a typo on the slide. It says 3 o'clock p.m. Uh, that's wrong. You have two more hours. It's actually 5 o'clock p.m. I think I got carried away typing my threes there with uh, 3 p.m. and 3, 3.15. It should be 5 p.m. Sorry about that. Okay, next we'll cover uh, what the proposals need to include. There are several components to the proposals, and these components are of three types. There's forms, uh, narratives, and attachments. Some of the components are subject to formatting restrictions, and it's to your advantage to pay attention to the, the order of the components, the formatting requirements, and internal consistency among the components. Uh, make sure your proposal has all of the components listed and that they appear in the required order. And page 14 of the RFP gives you a list of what the components are. And then uh, instructions for each component also start on page 14 of the RFP. So next we'll take a more detailed look at uh, each type of proposal component. First type is the forms. There are four forms. Uh, form 1 is the cover sheet, and it gives you a quick understanding of what the project is about. Form 2 allows us to determine whether partnership and geographic distribution requirements are met. Form 3 gives us a quick sense for the nature and timing of project professional development activities. And I referred to internal consistency earlier. Here's what I mean by that. You'll need to make sure that the numbers on forms 1, 2, and 3 are consistent with each other. These forms ask for numbers of participants, numbers of hours of professional development provided. Um, and, and so if you put down, uh, for example, numbers of hours on form 3 for each activity that don't add up to the total you put on form 1, uh, that would be a problem. So when you're doing these forms, um, this will make more sense. Just make sure that the numbers you put on the forms are consistent with each other. Probably the most difficult form to fill out is the budget form, so we'll look at that one in detail. Uh, if you'll turn to Form 4 on page 33 of the RFP, you'll see that the budget form is split into rows and columns. The rows identify the type of goods or services that the project will charge the grant for, and the columns identify which partner is using the money. So for example, total salaries paid to College of Education faculty would appear in row 1, column 1 of the form. Stipends paid to participating teachers from high-need school districts would be entered in row 6, column 3 of the form, and so forth. Uh, you may be wondering why so many columns. The reason the columns are, are there is that they're designed to ensure compliance with a federal rule that no partner in the project can use more than 50% of the funds made available to the project. So here is, is one limit uh, that relates to a question that was asked earlier about uh, what percentage of, the, percentage of the funds should various partners get. The only concrete limit is this 50% rule. Uh, no single partner uh, can use more than 50% of the funds made available to the project. So no single school district, uh, no single teacher, prep teacher preparation unit, no single math department, no single educational service district, 
and so forth uh, can use more than 50% of the funds made available. Now for detailed guidance on what the grant can and can't pay for, uh, see pages 16 through 18 of the RFP. I won't go over them all, but I would like to highlight a few. Uh, to begin with, there's a general federal rule that costs must be reasonable and necessary. Um, and generally, the grant can pay for the items listed as eligible on pages 16 through 17 of the RFP. Uh, this includes salaries, wages, and benefits for project personnel at their regular pay rates. Uh, there's no gouging here. Uh, and course releases for faculty are generally not a problem, but if you're using faculty overload pay, make sure that you're following the university's faculty overload policy. Uh, pay attention to your organization's conflict of interest rules when you're signing people up for the project. Uh, for example, it probably wouldn't be a good idea to hire your spouse to do the project's evaluation. Um, the grant can pay for stipends for participating K-12 educators, but only for time outside their normal work hours. And you have to limit yourself to a normal pay rate for participating in uh, professional development activities. So in other words, if, if you're serving a school district and that school district typically, pay, typically pays X dollars per hour for uh, its teachers to attend professional development events, then for this grant you shouldn't pay more than X dollars an hour uh, for stipends. Now there's a, an interesting twist here. Stipends for public school educators can be paid through the school, but stipends for private school educators have to be paid directly to the individual. And that weird rule has its basis in uh, federal law against mixing uh, public and private organization monies. It's kind of a strange quirk, but it's there and we have to follow it. Uh, grant funds can pay for supplies and materials for professional development activities, um, but you can only, only buy what's necessary for professional development purposes, uh, not for general classroom use purposes. Grant can pay subcontractor fees, but only if approved in advance by the Student Achievement Council. Uh, generally, we'll approve inclusion of reasonable fees for independent evaluators, but generally we won't approve fees for professional development providers acting as independent contractors. Uh, the idea here is uh, we're, we're paying you to, to bake a professional development cake rather than go purchase a bunch of professional development Twinkies off the shelf. Um, these are just a few examples and there are more listed in the RFP. Uh, you may have a cost in mind that isn't listed in the RFP. If you find one that's difficult to pigeonhole as allowable or not, uh, just send me an email or give me a call and, and ask for help, and I'll be happy to help you out. Um, for detailed guidance on what the grant cannot generally pay for, see pages 17 to 18 of the RFP. Uh, the no-nos include things like proposal development costs, um, faculty, faculty overload compensation that doesn't conform to university policy, um, payments to private school participants made through their schools rather than directly to the participants, uh, classroom sets of materials, space rental, parking fees, um, third-party conferences or training, uh, tuition, clock hour fees, uh, generally things that generally the grant can pay for costs and um, fees are not necessarily the same thing for cost. Uh, an entity could uh, a partner could be charging a fee, say, for parking that was actually more than what uh, the parking lot cost to maintain. So that's, that's the reason for shying away from a lot of these fees. Uh, another general no-no is food and beverages, with the possible exception of working lunches. Um, food is a very touchy issue right now with the federal government, and you have to work really hard to justify serving a working lunch, and you have to document that it was really necessary. And uh, I'm happy to provide help doing that. Just be warned that it's, um, it's not an easy sell. Um, please try and not include any questionable items, any luxuries in your budget. Um, that's risky on two levels. First, it may cost you some reviewer points. And second, uh, if you do include something and it does get approved and later Uncle Sam disallows it, um, it's going to be your organization's responsibility to uh, 
to repay the damages. So it's to your advantage to err on the side of being conservative uh, in charging costs when you're developing your budget. Now in addition to filling out this budget form, you'll need to attach a budget narrative that explains how the numbers on the form were calculated. There isn't any specified format for the narrative, but it has to be sufficiently detailed so readers will understand how each budget amount was calculated and to judge whether a budgeted expenditure is uh, reasonable and necessary. So here's another point where I'll pause for questions, and I see that a few have come in, so I'm going to take a moment here to scroll back up the list and see where I need to start. Okay, so here's a new one. Uh, it's not about budget, it relates to what we were talking about earlier. Is the inclusion of the Institution of Higher Education Teacher Development Partner intended to include teachers and in training in the PD? Um, and the answer is no. Uh, the, at least not, um, not as paid recipients. Uh, so the purpose of the, of the program is to provide professional development to in-service educators, not to pre-service educators. And the only exception to that is um, if there is an in-service, highly qualified paraprofessional who is also enrolled in a teacher prep program to, to try and become a certified teacher, then yes, the grant could pay uh, a stipend to that kind of highly qualified parapro. But that's, that's the only pre-service person um, who, who the grant's intended to provide training for. Okay, now having said that, if a, a pre-service person wants to attend one of the trainings and there's space available, and there's no extra cost to the grant, so the, the pre-service candidate is not getting paid a stipend, uh, then there is no harm in having the pre-service candidate attend in the training. But it, it's got to be at a no cost to the grant, uh, space available basis. Okay, here's another question. How much exposure do universities have to smarter balanced assessments? Are they the best source for training schools on how to use these tests? And the answer is, uh, it depends. Um, they have had, uh, presumably, the, uh, the people, the faculty involved, would have had experience in uh, interim assessments and uh, providing um, uh, instruction and professional development on how to use interim assessments in general. Now, few people in the state have had a lot of exposure to the interim assessments. Um, uh, the block uh, block assessments won't even be issued until January 7th, and the comprehensive uh, just got issued on January 6th. So nobody really has a lot of practice with those. Um, however, uh, the universities, uh, at least the ones who put forth good proposals, uh, will have had faculty that have had um, experience providing training on interim assessments in general. And so are they the best source for training schools on how to use these tests? Um, not sure. I hope so. Um, they, they should be uh, a highly capable source. Um, so sorry I can't give a more definitive answer on that. Um, uh, but do keep in mind that the universities are a required partner, and uh, that is federal law that we need to live with. Another question. Regarding the proposal narrative, can this be single-spaced? And the answer is yes, it can be. And that is actually uh, going a little bit ahead of us in the presentation here. Are there any questions about the budget? about what we can pay for, what we can't, about how to fill out the form. I'll pause for a few seconds to wait for a few more questions before we move on.
Okay, I'm not seeing any questions about the budget. I suppose that uh, will become more interesting to people as we move further in the, the application process. So I'll shift gears away from the forms now and uh, tell you about the proposal narrative uh, components. And that's the, the next set of, of components that are part of the proposal. There are four parts to the proposal narrative. Um, there's a professional development plan, an evaluation plan, management plan, and a description of the project's impact. The proposal narrative, uh, I'm sorry, the professional development plan describes your objectives, uh, strategies for obtaining, attaining those objectives, and activities for accomplishing the three pro required project goals. Um, yeah, so you outline your objectives, strategies, and activities for accomplishing the three required goals. Um, the professional development plan also describes the research base that gives us a reason to believe that the approach that you choose is sound. The evaluation plan describes how you will evaluate your success in accomplishing the required goals. Uh, the plan will assess changes in educator knowledge and practice. Um, what do educators know and do differently as a result of the project, in other words? Uh, the Student Achievement Council will be conducting a limited statewide evaluation regarding some aspects of the project, but projects are each required to do their own project-specific evaluation, too. And the Achievement Council evaluation will consist mainly of a combination of survey uh, questions and classroom observations, probably done by a Student Achievement Council staff. The management plan describes who will do what and outlines project personnel qualifications. And the project impact section is your chance to convince reviewers that the project will have a significant impact. Uh, we're looking for a, a case built along several dimensions. Um, we're looking for a, a compelling rationale for how the project will impact student outcomes. We're looking for integration of the project with school or district plans. Um, presumably a project that fits in with school or district plans would have a, a greater sustained impact than one that didn't. Uh, we're looking for synergy with other professional development initiatives. Um, we're always trying to, to leverage funding so it will have a greater impact. And we're looking for impact on the teacher or principal preparation uh, pro uh, and professional development programs that are offered by the uh, College of Arts and Sciences or teacher principal prep higher education partner. This kind of impact on higher ed is one of the outcomes that the federal government uh, intends for the program that I mentioned back at the beginning of the webinar. So at this point we'll leave the narrative and move on to the attachments. There's five types of attachments. The first is a one-page logic model that represents the project's theory of action. Uh, second is a list of references that you cited in the proposal narrative. Um, you should only include uh, scientifically based research, and there's a definition for that on the page 9 of the RFP. And please don't include any references that you don't actually cite in your narrative. Uh, the third attachment is a certification of school support and you'd attach one of these for each of the schools to be served by the project. There's a template in Exhibit A uh, on page 27 of the RFP. Um, these indicate the level of the school's enthusiasm for the project, and they could be looked at by evaluators as evidence of potential impact. Um, these also serve as, as indicators of need for the project. Uh, if you get one back from a school that's just lukewarm, you may want to consider leaving that school out of your project. Uh, or you could leave it in in hopes that the school will come around. Anyway, these can be useful indicators to you uh, as you design the project uh, as to how enthusiastic a school is about being involved. Uh, fourth attachment is uh, curriculum vita for key project personnel. Uh, these should be one-pagers outlining qualifications. Um, like relevant employment, relevant courses taught, relevant research, involvement with similar projects. Uh, don't include any home addresses, phones, or emails, please. Uh, the last attachment, and this should be the last page of your proposal, is a certifications and 
assurances document. Uh, this is um, uh, a template. There's a template for this in Exhibit B on page 28 of the RFP. This one has to be signed and dated by an official authorized to legally bind uh, legally bind the lead partner, the fiscal agent, to a contractual relationship. Um, so the entity that submits the proposal would be the entity that signs this certifications and assurances document. Um, one thing this does do for you is it provides you with an opportunity to request exceptions to contract terms if you wish. Um, I'll have contract templates available that you can look at so that you can see in advance uh, what kind of an agreement that your uh, your organization would be entering into if it does uh, get funded under this RFP. So here's another pause for questions. And so far I don't see any new ones. So I'll wait a few seconds to see if anyone has any new questions to ask. Okay, um, well that wraps it up for proposal com contents, uh, for, for what you need to include in the proposal. So next we'll consider the evaluation of the proposals. So this slide I'm showing now outlines um, the steps in the evaluation process. Um, so we receive your proposals by 5 p.m. on March 3rd. And then what I will do starting that night and going into the next day is I'll take a look at your proposals before forwarding to them to the reviewers. And what I will look for is um, uh, simple stuff, completeness. Did you check boxes you were supposed to check? Um, are forms one through three internally consistent with each other in terms of the numbers on the forms? Uh, have you followed the page and format um, requirements for the narrative portion of the proposal. Um, there's a 12-page limit to the narrative, and uh, you, you need to follow that limit. Um, things like that, that's what I'll check for. Uh, and it, it's kind of harsh if you don't follow the 12-page limit. What I'll do is let you know, and I'll ask you to rewrite the narrative so it fits in 12 pages, and if you aren't able to do that, then I'm stuck forwarding just the first 12 pages of the narrative to the reviewers, and, and I hate to do that, and we've always in the past been able to avoid it. Uh, past applicants have been able to, to meet the 24-hour turnaround time uh, to respond to, to questions I raise as part of my uh, staff screening here. So after the staff screening is done, and um, all the page limits are, are followed and the margins are one inch on the narrative and the forms are internally consistent and so forth. Then I forward the proposal to uh, a team of reviewers. Uh, they'll review and score the proposals. And um, then um, we may, depending on the number of, of applications, um, we may ask you to give a presentation to a selection panel, um, uh, or we may not. Uh, I, that still remains to be seen, uh, and I'll try and let you know more about that uh, as soon as I know more about it. Um, so we will have reviewers review and score for sure, and then depending on the proposals we get, we may have a second step in the process that involves an in-person presentation by you um, uh, to a selection panel. And the selection panel may consist of different people than the ones that scored the reviewed and scored the proposals, uh, but the selection panel, regardless of who's on it, would have the review and score uh, comments um, and scores from the reviewers uh, to inform their decision. So let's talk a little bit about scoring. Uh, there's a scoring rubric 
Uh, that's uh, the last few pages of the RFP. And um, it's on pages 38 through 45. It's divided into six sections. And um, the first three of those six sections, which um, are 30 points, 15 points, and 15 points respectively, are all um, related to uh, how well, um, how, how convincing is it that uh, the project is going to do a good job of attaining the three required project goals. So you can see that 60 out of the 100 points total uh, is, is all related to these three required goals. Um, and then uh, the remaining 40 points is split among the management plan, uh, project impact, and project budget. But you really do need to focus on those three required goals. That's where you get most of your reviewer points. Um, I'll close the formal part of the presentation by pointing out to you some resources that are available. There's a resources page on Exhibit D, uh, uh, page 34 of the RFP, that's got links to reports, webinars, and web pages that can be helpful to you in answering questions. Um, that you have as you develop the proposal. Uh, especially helpful are, are links to the OSPI and Smarter Balance web pages. Uh, there's also a link to the Student Achievement Council's Educators for the 21st Century web page. Um, that could have actually answered one of the earlier questions during this webinar, I think. We'll put a link to the recording of this webinar on that web page, um, as well as a Q&A document based on questions asked during the webinar. And then we'll update that Q&A document to include questions of general interest that come in later through your own individual emails. Um, but I won't include any, any personal identifiable information. Uh, the questions will just be reformatted so that they're stated in general terms. Um, I'll send you up updates. Um, to the Q&A and, and let you know when other website updates are available. Uh, just let me know if you're interested in receiving those updates. A number of you already have. Um, and I will post contract templates and report templates to the Educators for the 21st Century webpage so you can see in advance what those will look like. And you can get your accounting and budget staff looking at them early in the process so that they, they're not uh, jammed into doing that at the last minute. I'm also willing to come to meet with you personally uh, to explain the program or answer questions. I'm, I'm happy to, to come see you face to face. Uh, as you can tell, I'm not the greatest at uh, online presentation and I do like face to face much better. Um, I will close with a reminder that notices of intent are due next Friday. Um, and one of those questions that are asked for the notice of intent is your permission uh, to share contact information with other projects. Um, and this is for purposes of encouraging collaboration. Um, at the Student Achievement Council, we're big fans of collaboration. Uh, we really think it en enriches our lives, other people's lives. And we'd encourage you to collaborate, too. Um, if you're feeling fatigued or daunted by the RFP, uh, maybe it'd be less fatiguing or daunting if you joined forces with somebody else, and, and we'd be happy to serve as sort of a matchmaker for helping people do that. So I'll now open up the floor for general questions, and I'll check to see if anything has come in since the last one. So far, the answer is no. So are there any questions you've asked so far that you feel I didn't adequately address? If so, um, you can copy and paste them and ask them again or, or try asking them in a different way uh, that might elicit a better answer from me. Um, so anyway, I'll just pause for a few seconds and, and wait for your questions. This is the end of the formal part of the presentation.
Okay, well that was a long silence. I'm getting the impression that um, there are no further questions, at least for during the meeting. Um, if you do come up with questions later, please email me uh, or call me with them. Um, and again, I am happy to, to travel to your place uh, to discuss things face to face if you wish. Just let me know and give me a little lead time. Thank you all very much uh, for your questions today. Excellent questions. Um, I will uh, close the webinar and um, wish you well. I look forward to working with you further. Thank you. Have a nice weekend.